just occasionally a voice will come along and your hairs go ting. And she had that. It's sort of like a cross between PF and Broadway. She had the kind of frailty and in a sense the same kind of notes as, say, Judy Garland. You don't want somebody just to do a faithful rendition of your song. You want somebody to take it and make it their own. And anything Laurie sang, in some way she made her own. Through a storm, hold your head I used to just, you know, throw songs at Laurie over and over. Here, try this one, try this one, and she would perform them. Extraordinary voice, extraordinary vivacity. She could hit the back row of wherever, whatever theater she was playing. life tragically came to an end so prematurely and she never once let her problems get in the way of living her life to the full and giving her all to the audience and you know that's pretty remarkable there aren't many people I've known in the theatre who are like Laurie. She's an example of the working performers who show after show, film after film, are the heart and soul of our profession. Only she has more courage than most. To a lot of her fellow performers, Lori Beachman is one of the biggest stars around. From the very beginning, when I was first diagnosed with cancer, I was just moving forward. You just have to move. You can't stay still. All I have known is to push forward. I still have the disease, I still have to take my medicine, but I'm still going forward. I don't think anything grows more strongly in me than hope. And that is my middle name, Laurie Hope Beachman. Laurie Hope Beachman was Broadway royalty. That doesn't mean you know who she was, but you would remember her voice. She was the star behind the marquee lights in some of the biggest shows around. Laurie Beachman lived by the cliché that the show must go on. And, for an amazingly long time, it did. Everyone knows Annie now, but back in 1976, at the Goodspeed Opera House in Connecticut, no one imagined that a little musical about comic strip orphans would be a Broadway sensation, making stars of the young girls who sang their hearts out. In the original company of Annie, she didn't play Annie, but she played five roles during the time she spent in that show. She was also in Pirates of Penzance. You have never heard a more powerful and beautiful voice in your life. She's going to sing right now for you that big song that she didn't do in Annie uh, called Tomorrow, and you will love her. Here's Laurie Beachman. Laurie? <laughs> The first time I met Lori was, uh, we both had just gotten the show Annie. The sun will come out tomorrow, bet your bottom dollar. And it was my big break, it was her big break. There'll be sun. The first time we were rehearsing uh, Singing Tomorrow and, and all of the songs from Annie, uh, we were around the piano, and uh, there's Martin Charnin, Charles Strauss, and Tom Meehan. And uh, I heard Laurie sing for the first time. When I'm stuck with a day that's gray and lonely, I just stick out my chin and grin and say. And Martin Charnin asked me, you haven't heard anything like that since Barbara Streisand. I was like, Barbara who? Eight little girls who all, you know, sing their butts off and dance and, you know, want to do this for a living. And we finally had a role model. And I always remember somebody behind me said, Who is that girl with a beautiful voice? She's great. Oh, I got the goose pimples as her mother. <laughs>
Lori was 23 when she landed those five parts in Annie. One of them was called, simply, a star to be. She had prepared for that role all her life. When I was a kid growing up, uh, uh, my dad, uh, he was kind of a, a semi-professional singer. He loved to sing. And um, this was one of the first songs that uh, he ever introduced me to. So this is like the song that lives for the kid at heart, and it has lasted me a lifetime. On the day I was born, said my father, said he, I have an elegant legacy waiting for you. There's a rhyme for your lips and a song for your heart. To sing it used to be that Broadway shows started out in Philadelphia. Lori Beachman started out there too. In 1954, growing up with sisters Jane and Claudia. Lori's first appearance was about when she was about eight or nine. In my basement, we had this theater with those coffee uh, can uh, painted black inside with the uh, spotlights on this makeshift stage. You see the neon lights are bright 90 on minutes from Broadway, Broadway, they called it. They say there's always magic. She loved to sing, and she was good. She sang at Daddy's uh, restaurant. This 16 year old girl, I remember. And Laurie would get up with my father and just sing. It was pretty informal. Yeah. And you yeah. know, I'd say, oh, it's my daughter Laurie, and she would get up and sing. As a teen, Laurie landed a starring role in every one of her high school productions. Lori followed her dreams to New York City, studying at New York University, paying her dues as a singing waitress. There wasn't a musical note that Lori didn't love. There was the folk singing Lori, and rocker Lori in the size. And in one of her first professional jobs, she went Motown with black boys in the movie version of Hair. Lori's the girl on the left. Black boys are delicious. I first met Lori after I'd written Little Shop of Horrors. There was just this whole group of people who were, you know, we were young and we were talented and we were so happy to be associated with each other and our, all of our careers were, were just bursting. It was with Joseph that, that she really came to the public's attention. In 1981, British composer Andrew Lloyd Webber was bringing his own rock musical to America, Joseph and the Amazing Technicolor Dreamcoat. Laurie took on the starring role of the narrator in its Broadway debut. And I had seen the show and I was pretty knocked out by her voice. I mean, she was this adorable pixie on the stage in, the, in this turban. And I recognized that this was a perfect voice for my music. Of course, she was a perfect voice for just about anybody's music. Way, way back many centuries ago, not long after the Bible began, Jacob lived in the land of Cain in a fine example of Laurie absolutely was a rock and roll singer who could also do theater. She could growl out you know, a blues song and give a really nasty rock riff vocally. The part of the narrator had been written for a man, but not only could Lori sing the part, her talent reinvented the role. I went on uh, a, a kind of location hunt with uh, Andrew Lloyd Webber. We were both absolutely riveted by this girl playing the storyteller. It's a role, though, that in a sense she created if I remember rightly, I think it was the first time that a girl had ever played that role. And her performance sort of became so definitive that um, from that time onwards, 90% of the professional productions of Joseph have always had the narrator played by a girl. It was red and yellow and green and brown and 
scarlet and black and ochre and peach and ruby and olive and violet and fawn and lilac and gold and chocolate and mauve. Annie got her notice, but Joseph was her Tony Award nomination. We did the show together every night, and I conducted it, and she starred in it. I just remember people were just screaming, and what it was, I mean, it was not only her voice, but Lori had this thing where she just went for the audience. She had to get that audience. One day she asked me, she said, I have to do a couple of songs for a little event. Would you play for me? New York City's late night singing spots, cabaret clubs like Good Times and the Ballroom were where Broadway singers could strut their stuff. For Laurie Beachman, it was a second brilliant career. Laurie would come into these places and sell them to the rafters because she was a theater star. And when she decided to do a club act, it was an event. Ladies and gentlemen, Laurie Beachman. She was a star in this medium and drove people wild. What it was with Laurie was it was about beautiful, beautiful music. The accompaniments were sort of, you could do the simplest things because she could sing with a thread of voice. I would just play and sort of leaving a space for that beautiful voice to come through. Halfway through the wood, others may deceive you. Decide what's good. You decide alone, but truly, no one is alone. She had this wonderful upper register, and of course, in the upper register, that's where things soar. And, and you know, when, when it, it's very frustrating for a composer when you write something and someone hits a note and it vibrates up there, but it doesn't just soar. And Laurie would just make songs, just, you know, hit the stratosphere. Um, I had a song called Sailing On, which was a song I wrote with Dean Pitchford. And uh, this is very dramatic moment where the song just bursts into a high note and then goes into an instrumental. Gave the best performance of that song of anyone. God, she could deliver a you know a button of a song. You know, that would just bring the house down. And at the same time, sing so sweetly, so quietly, and just, you know, reduce a room to uh, hearing a pin drop. Look at what's happened to me. I can't believe it myself. Suddenly I'm up on top of the world. Should have been somebody else. Believe it or not, I'm walking on air. I never thought I could feel so free. Flying away on a wing and a prayer. Who could it be? Believe it or not, it's just me. You don't know it while it's happening, but those were just very, we were all on Broadway, we were all in cabaret, we, they were wonderful days. This is too good to be true, look at me, here we do. Back in England, Andrew Lloyd Webber and Trevor Nunn were working on a new show based on a collection of children's poems by the great modern poet T.S. Eliot. When Andrew was preparing Cats, the role of Grisabella didn't exist. Andrew was given a fragment of verse by T.S. Eliot's widow. It just said at the top, Grisabella the Glamour Cat. He'd written a note to the publishers. I haven't included this in the collection because it is too sad for children. I think what Eliot meant was that that little snatch of verse is about mortality. It's about how beauty fades. It's about 
how age leads to loneliness, how you face death. That last minute character, Grizabella, would be the emotional center of the longest running show in Broadway history and one of the most important roles of Laurie's career. When Laurie came in to audition for Cats, I, I'm expecting a wonderful voice, but this is a long shot because I remember her as being uh, extraordinarily youthful. Let's see, the last time I left you, what was the scenario? Oh, you were in Joseph and the Technicolor yes. Dreamcoat. Yes. Right, right. Stopping shows nightly there. But then how did you get... Well, honestly, I... Cat. I don't know how it happened, except that when I was in Joseph, uh, uh, Andrew Lloyd Webber, the composer, brought Trevor Nunn to see my performance, thinking that I might be a possible candidate for the role of Grizabella in the original Broadway company. Right. And Trevor, the word came back to me that Trevor felt I had too much youthful exuberance for the role. Well, a year later, I well, found you have to be an old, tired she's cat. She's very right? tired, and yeah. she's like a faded glamour queen, and yeah. she's kind of really on her last legs. At the time the Cats was casting, they were uh, very stuck on the fact that, you know, Grizabella needed to be this worn, tired, run-down kind of thing. Laurie always had a very mature voice. She never, she never even though she was young, she never sounded young. She didn't sound old either, it, it, she sounded lived in. And so I, I had absolutely no problem about deciding that uh, the magical voice was of course perfectly suited to that great song. And I got the part and he called me from England to tell me. Frail Laurie it was extraordinary, extraordinary as, uh, as Grisabella. Probably Laurie was the most touching Grisabella that we've ever had in Cats. Her chest voice contained a kind of extraordinary uh, emotional outcry. It had a rawness and an absolute humanity. Laurie wasn't the first Grizabella, and she wasn't the last, but she was the most. She played the part more times than anyone else from 1983 to 1988, then came back to do the ninth anniversary and the 10th and the historic performance when Cats broke Broadway records. Laurie Beachman from the Broadway musical Cats, congratulations to all of you. Why do you think it's been so incredibly successful? Well, I think that Cats, it has a universal theme to it. It's a, it's, there's an awful lot in the show about redemption and hope and uh, rebirth and a second chance. And I think people can relate to 
there's a lot of pageantry, but there's also an awful lot about uh, what people long for in life, which is hope. People asked Cat Laurie many times if she got tired of doing Cats, and she said, absolutely not. Why should someone get tired of singing one of the best songs ever written, getting to be a lead in a Broadway show, and live out a dream, and doing it all as if no one had ever seen it before? It's that old Joe DiMaggio line. There may be one kid out there that's never seen me play before. I have to do my best for him. Laurie lived that. You have to have tremendous stamina to work on Broadway because it's a lot of energy. It's eight shows a week. It kind of is where the workhorses live. Can you do the same thing eight times a week, night after night, month after month, year after year? She could. She loved it. For an actress, nothing is more rewarding than being a part of the creation of a new musical. In 1988, Lori got that chance with a show called Dangerous Music. But something wasn't right. I was doing a show at the Burt Reynolds Jupiter Theater, a brand new musical by the guys who wrote Dream Girls, Henry Krieger and Tom Lyon. And I was being raped in this show, and I was thrown all over the stage, and I thought, well, I'm just, just being you know, beaten up in the show. This is why I hurt. But every day I had to, at the end of rehearsal or the performance, I had to go back to my apartment and sleep. And I would start the show and feel pretty horrible and then kind of get into it and be okay. It wasn't until months later when she was rehearsing to play Fantine in the national tour of Les Miserables that she found out what was really wrong, ovarian cancer. She immediately had surgery, but the news wasn't good. And then the doctor, he said, well, you know she only has two years to live. And I said, please don't tell her that. Don't tell her that. And of course, he immediately went in there and did just that. But the way she faced all of that was astonishing to me. She lived nine years, not those two years, nine, with the three recurrences. The bleak prognosis was underlined by the news just then being splashed on the cover of People magazine. Comedian Gilda Radner, 42, had died of the same disease. Lori got sick the same year Gilda Radner died. And Lori was in a grocery store, and the woman picked up the magazine with Gilda Radner on the cover and said, what a remarkable woman. And Lori broke down in the store and screamed, but she's dead. Lori was still alive, still was dealing with cancer. Gilda didn't make it. After her cancer diagnosis, she was, as anyone would be, shell-shocked. I think she was uh, most concerned about getting well. Of course, the career had to go on the back burner. And she said, mother, and she was crying, and she said, I've been benched. And by that, of course, she meant she would never be employed again or get work again. That was the worst thing that could have happened to her. After Lori was ready to get back to work, I was concerned about her uh, ability to work. Uh, it was not a particularly big secret in the industry that she had cancer. And I think that where nobody would be as um, impolite to say, we're not hiring her because we know she's sick. She didn't get hired, except by the people that stepped up to the plate to say, come back into our theaters, go to work in our shows. It was an extraordinary offer, keeping a part open for a performer who was undergoing chemotherapy. But the Schubert organization and the producers of Les Mis felt that Lori's performance would justify the risk. And I said, you get through this, you get through this, and I will bring you to Broadway, you have my word. The minute she was through the woods, I brought her right into Broadway, no road company, no nothing, she came in. And I said, look, Richard, I absolutely, we must just make this part available for her um, whenever she is ready to come back. When Laurie got the role in Les Mis, it was like she was reborn. It was a gift that I think she certainly deserved, but she felt like she was back in the world of the well. I don't think I'll ever expect to relive a moment like her opening night on Broadway in Les Miserables because in the scenes where Fontaine is in the hospital, the character Fontaine, Laurie knew exactly where to go. With their voices soft 
as thunder. It was a very apt character for Laurie to play at that time of life because, of course, it is about someone who is very beautiful, who just lost everything in life and went through every deprivation. I think after cancer, um, she was just exploding to, to share everything. Lori was always a great singer. It was after her cancer diagnosis that she became a great artist. It seemed to make Lori completely zone in on whatever it is she needed to say. It was just like, no nonsense. There's no time to fool around. Let's just hit it. All my life, I've been on a road Going one way toward one dream The road would wind and down it I would go Always searching, never finding in my darkest hour, I always knew that someday, somehow, the road would lead to you. And words can't express how my heart's filled with happiness. Listen to it, listen to my heart, listen to it sing. Listen to my voice, it wants to tell you everything. Listen to my song, listen to it soar. I've waited all these years for this one moment. I'm not waiting anymore. Listen to my In 1990, she released her first album, a riveting collection of Broadway anthems and new songs. The title cut, Listen to My Heart, was written especially for her by the album's producer, her old friend and colleague, David Friedman. She had just come through her first bout of cancer, and she was doing her first album, which I was producing. It's interesting, the input of a great singer. I, I had uh, written it, and it's a song that builds and builds and builds, and it went, uh, it went, and you're here, and you're listening, you're listening, listen to my heart. That's the way I wrote it. And Laurie said, I, I need something like that kind of lifts there. Can you give me? And it ends up here, and you're listening. You're, you're listening. listening. Listen to my voice, and it will tell you everything. All about the life that's just about to start. Well, if you want to know how much I love you. When you had a great singer like Laurie who had instincts like that, you rewrote for her. Uh, there was something, you know, one of the small handful of extremely important musical experiences and, uh, that, that I've had. Laurie's marriage to Neil was the oasis of her life. It, it meant everything to her. It was, the, it was the greatest thing that ever happened to her one of those backstage romances that actually happened. Now, this is 10 years after I met her. Lori was still a cat when she met production carpenter Neil Mazzella backstage at the Winter Garden in 1982. Over the years, she would take on and off her whiskers, and he would become the owner of a theatrical scene-building studio. But eventually, she would find in him the kind of love she was always singing about. They were a match made on Broadway. 
Now you're getting married uh, soon. Soon is what? <laughs> Next week, Ten right? Days. Oh, Ten days. But who's counting? <laughs> Oh. Oh. And you said, I read somewhere you said, I thought I'd never get married. Why is that? I, I, well, I don't want to say I don't think anybody would have me, but... <laughs> uh, well, this guy looks like he would. <laughs> yes, in a second. That's Look. Neil. Neil, yeah. yeah, my renaissance man. We met ten years ago. Mm. We never dated, but we knew each other. We were friends. And uh, um, he, is, he, he belongs to a motorcycle club. He's got a Harley, and he's been to Yale. And so nice. I, I can't tell you. It's like stepping into someone else's life. You know, if cats have nine lives, I've certainly yeah. been blessed with the tenth. When the sky and the ground start in rain. Neil said to me, Dolly, he's very direct, I love your daughter, Laurie, and I want to marry her. And I said, well, with my blessings. In I said, let's go to Vegas, get married New Year's Eve. And she said, I'm not waiting that long. I'll plan it, it's in October, and that's when we'll get married. That makes me I didn't know this, but she was always working against a clock. We were fully believed that there was no problem. Every medical advice we had gotten suggested that. I guess in her heart she always knew that she had to make the most of everything. Every day, every hour, every experience. And that's why we didn't wait till New Year's Eve. We got married in October. life was brimming. A married lady, back on Broadway in Cats, and back in the recording studio with an album of Andrew Lloyd Webber songs. When Lori was happy, she was happier than anybody I know. She was so full of joy, and those eyes would just light up. Lori was transformed for her cabaret comeback. Director Richard J. Alexander had her in sequins and no longer singing the blues. I remember I put Lori in an orange dress, and you know, and everybody loved the orange dress. When I was putting this music together, I thought I was thinking about my career, and I was thinking about the roles that I played on stage, and I played some pretty dismal babes. We know that. <laughs> I did not want to do the Valley of the Ballads one more time. I didn't want to, like, you know, do the prostrate. Oh, she's going to heaven, and she's going to die in a bed, and she's got consumption, and she's a <laughs> prostitute, and oh, this poor woman. So just to be able to kind of tell you a little bit about myself and the music that interests me and 
beyond just the roles that I play. Life is about taking chances and taking risks. And really, when you think about it, how many chances do we get? She loved the business. She loved singing. She loved being in shows, you know, and always hoped that the next one was going to be the one that would skyrocket it to a different place. <laughs> Then have you returned to CATS? I had returned to CATS. I had uh, chemotherapy in 89 and surgery. Uh, I went back to CATS for a ninth anniversary. I went into Les Miserables Fontaine right. between my first bout and my second bout. Uh -huh. In 91, I had another bout. And uh, at the after 91, then I went into Les Miserables. Then I went into a remission for three and a half years, went into CATS, recorded two albums, did Radio City Music Hall with Michael Crawford, and a lot of other things, and... Um, between bouts. Between bouts, and You then, sound like a fighter. It is In a fight, a it are. is a fight. Right, now, when was your last bout? It's now. 1995. Opened and closed her. She was awake a couple of hours later, said to me, called me Moon, she said, Moon, we got a problem, because they had told her what the results were. Within a day, she started demanding chemotherapy. They didn't give her a year to live after that day. Two months after that operation, she was on the Phil Donahue show, talking about having cancer, singing, and looking gorgeous. You've been always been this kind of, uh, you know, gorilla? <coughs> no, probably. I mean, <laughs> An animal, yeah. I mean, really, you have to be tough. Uh, I think show business helped me. I think uh, doing eight shows a week for 13 years, just being in that discipline, I never thought of anything but fighting and it was before me it wasn't as if I had a choice I mm -hmm. just yeah it was what I had to do uh -huh. I assume you didn't believe it at first I don't know I mean if they took uh, you know I, it's it, just like in the movies and on soap operas denial. you say I feel like I'm in a dream and then we said this I mean the third time when when we went through this a month ago I I had a hard time praying after this last announcement but I have tremendous the alternative is unthinkable so <laughs> go I just go Lori became public about her disease because I think she wanted to dispel the notion that one dies from cancer, especially ovarian cancer, rather than living with it. Lori now used her public image and talents to ensure the creation of Gilda's Club. On our stage uh, joining us, Joanna Bull, you're a therapist for Gilda's Club. Yes. One of the many very positive things that developed in the wake of the loss of this very talented actress. Is Gene that so? Wilder and I are co-founders of this and it will be a cancer support community. Lori is such a marvelous example of how to do it, how to not feel alone, how to, to talk to people, how to find out what's going on. Here to prove that she's uh, more than just uh, alive. She's alive, well, vibrant, and talented as always. Everybody says don't. Lori Beecher. It's a voice that's not just musical, but so deeply alive and vital, and as she hoped, healing. Everybody says don't, everybody says don't, everybody says don't, it isn't right, don't, it isn't nice. Everybody says don't, everybody says don't, everybody says don't walk on the grass, don't disturb the peace, don't skate on the ice. Well, I say do. Walking the grass was meant to feel, I say, sail, tilt at the windmill, and if you fail, you fail. All the nevers that had been thrown at her were dispelled, and she dispelled them all. Sometimes you gotta start small, climbing the tiniest wall. Maybe you're going to fall, but it's better than a star. Everybody says don't, everybody says stop, everybody says wait around for miracles, that's the way the world is made. I insist in miracles, if you do them miracles, nothing to them. I say don't, don't be afraid. About seven years ago, in 1989, I was diagnosed with ovarian cancer. And in the year that followed, I became haunted by the word never. I thought constantly about 
all the things I'd never get to do, and I thought about all the great things that I'd never get to do again. I thought, I'll never work again. I'll never be in a Broadway show again. I'll never have the strength to sing again. I'll never fall in love and get married. I'll never see Paris. But my list of nevers has become very short. And if you ask me if I have any regrets, I would have to say that I only have two. My first regret is that I couldn't go back to Paris. A month ago, with my husband, <laughs> because I was working. Oh. <laughs> and my second regret is that if I had known, I would be bald three times in my life from chemotherapy, I would have let Dr. Axelrod pin my ears back. <laughs> She never complained. She would say, oi, I'm just like so exhausted. Uh, and I would say, how are you going to do this tonight? I don't know. I have no idea, but I'll do it. Nothing stopped her from getting on stage, not even cancer. And I think what kept her alive was singing. In 1996, despite ongoing chemotherapy, Lori went back into Les Mis for its return engagement in Philadelphia. I do remember when the, the cancer drugs got to be just so much. They were just so polluting her body. I remember an opening night in Philly. She actually didn't know where she was. And she was on her cot in her dressing room. And it was the last scene. She had gotten through the show. And she blanked. And she just looked at me. You know, this is a theater girl. Lori doesn't blank. And she just goes, Richard, just remind me, what am I doing? What, what am I doing right now? And I said, you know, you're coming back as the ghost. It's because that's wedding. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But the minute the music started, where she was supposed to walk out barefoot in her white gown, a candle lip, she had no trouble because music was her way. It was her life. No One Is Alone was her final solo album. Amazingly, she chose for her opening song, these are the good times. These are the great times. And no one really understood what was going on because she had conned everyone into thinking that life will go on forever because she was just so full of life. <laughs> that is Laurie from Joseph on Broadway. Yeah, that was big. You were nominated for a Tony, didn't you? A voice. That you can go home. I love your voice. You're Thanks. so great. Oh, thank you. Now tell everyone the story behind this CD, Songs well, of Hope and Inspiration from Broadway. This is, um, it's called No One Is Alone, and I, I um, what, what's, what, the inspiration behind it had to do with the fact that I had been diagnosed with ovarian cancer in 1989. This was, you know, four records later, I think I finally actually said what, I've been trying to say. And well, how are you feeling? Are you feeling good? It's, it's managed, but, uh, you know, it's hard work. What was never work for Lori was the singing, and she found new joy with friend and Broadway singer Sam Harris. It was a joy. Lori would come over to my house, hang her wig up on a lamp, and we would sing for, you know, three or four hours. But to me, to you, and to me, to me, we sing very differently, but when we sang together, we sometimes sounded like the same person. So we started taping. And when we would listen back to the tape, we would say, was that you on top or is that me on top? Was that you on the harmony? Did, what did you, was that you doing that line or was that me? We literally couldn't tell. If you're wondering what I'm asking in return, dear, you'll be glad to know that my demands are small. We used to say each other, oh, 
before we would go on, the last thing we would say to each other is, I sing better with you. I sing better with you. That's all. That's all. That's all. That's all. Lori said to me that her biggest fear was being erased as if she hadn't existed. But it was this, God damn it, I'm going to matter. I'm going to have an effect. And I don't know that she ever really realized the effect that she had. The spotlight was to be on Lori one final time. Just a year before she died, she was invited to sing the big finale at President Bill Clinton's second inaugural gala. Among her opening acts, Aretha Franklin, and Bernadette Peters. The inaugural event was big. It was a big deal. Lori was the only person on the bill that we had never heard of. Lori was the only person on the bill that Lori never heard of. National television and all those things that Lori was born to do and, you know, in a sort of 11th hour greatness and uh, boy did she deliver the goods. The whole world was going to know who Lori Beachman was, the whole country. And she closed the show with a 100 person gospel choir backing her up and got to introduce the president. It was big. How do you describe the happiest girl in the world?
chipper all the day, happy with my lot. Oh, do I get that way? Look at what I've got. I got rhythm, I got music, I got my man who can ask for anything more. I got daisies in green pastures. I got my man who can ask for anything more. Old man trouble, I don't mind him. You won't find him hanging around my door. I got starlight, I got sweet dreams. I got my man who can ask for anything more. Who can ask for anything more? Do -do 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 -do. Do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do